Good afternoon. It's, uh, it's good to be back with you as we uh, approach uh, the final session and looking at uh, narratives, imagination, and experiencing God. So let me just uh, review briefly where we've been since uh, last night. And uh, so far, we've looked at some of the, the major characteristics of Old Testament narratives. And among some of those major characteristics, you remember, is that um, the biblical narratives withhold much of the information that we are used to getting in stories. Things like physical description, um, the motivation of the characters. We sometimes get that, but not very often. And then there are the characteristics of repetition and the fact that what uh, we make of characters is conveyed through, to us through speech and actions. This is all well known to you by now, right? Right. Um, then we had a look at uh, biblical characters and saw how characters are conveyed, sometimes through physical description, th by giving us their inner thoughts, often through comparisons and contrasts. We compare this character with that character, or we compare how a character acts here with how a character acts somewhere else. And so we get a rounded picture. But as readers, as hearers of these stories, we are the ones having to do the work. We have to bring these together. The narrator is not going to explicitly do all of that work for us. We need to use our imagination. One of the great things about using your imagination is that when you use it and you discover something you've never seen before, you never forget it. You think of all the sermons you've heard where all you've heard is what you already know and you don't remember them. But when you, in your own Bible study, discover something that you've never seen before, it stays with you for the rest of your life. Um, and then we had a look during uh, the summer school period on how to read the Old Testament. And we looked at characteristics of Hebrew thought, things like uh, exaggeration, deliberate exaggeration, sort of going over the top, as we would think, in, in uh, describing things. Uh, aspects of divine responsibility, corporate worldview, rather than individualism, looking at the world as part of a community. And then we looked at the comparison between Greek thought and Hebrew thought. So that's, that's what lies behind us. What we're going to have a look at initially here is the plot of narratives. And in looking at the plot of biblical narratives, we're looking at what biblical narratives share with all narratives. Because any narrative, any narrative written in any language uh, or culture has a plot. But sometimes we use the word plot uh, in rather uh, general terms. So what we're going to be looking at now is something a little more specific. Uh, when we talk about plot, what we'll be looking at is the structure of narratives. How is a narrative put together? And if we understand that, it gives us a lot of help in deciding what is of primary importance and what is of secondary importance. I know we've had more than one question so far, far and an obvious question, which is, um, how can you come to any kind of conclusion then concerning a narrative? Well, if we take attention uh, to plot, that helps us to see what is more important what is less important in this particular story? So what do we, uh, the general st statement concerning plot then, this is one which comes from a general literature, well-known uh, volume on literature, is that plot is, first of all, a constant of all written and oral narrative, in that a narrative without at least a minimal plot would be incomprehensible. So to have a narrative, we need to have a plot. So this, of course, the question some of you may have, yeah, but what is it? Well, we're getting there, all right? And this includes biblical narratives. So um, any story needs to have a structure to it so that we can follow it. And what I hope to show is that there is a common structure to all narratives. This is true of any story. It's true of the most profound chapter in the Bible and of the latest episode of your favorite soap opera. Okay? Uh, assuming that you participate in that kind of 
artistic uh, wonder. Um, but what exactly is plot then? That's what we want to have a look at. What is plot? How does it achieve these functions of structuring a story so that it makes sense of it? And perhaps, as the question, as I was talking over lunch, the question I often write at the bottom of uh, students' essays, you know, so what? Um, how? <laughs> Once we've seen the plot and we have seen how it works, how does that help us to appreciate biblical stories more? Now, the way in which plots have been um, analyzed, um, you will get slightly different ways in which this has been done. What I'm going to deal with uh, this afternoon is the classic plot structure, okay? So, um, when people talk about plots, if we begin with this classic plot structure, and then w this will keep it simple, rather than getting into French post-structuralism or, or anything else like that. Um, so, the easiest way to do this, I think, is to begin with a short biblical narrative, and let's just see how it's put together, and how we can therefore see this is the plot structure. So, advance information is that plots usually have five steps to them, a five-fold structure to a plot. And we're going to look, just to show, uh, to demonstrate the fact that all narratives have plot. Rather than using an Old Testament narrative, I'm going to use a short New Testament narrative because this works equally well with whatever narrative you're talking about, Old Testament, New Testament, or elsewhere. So, if we begin by looking at um, Matthew 8, verses 14 to 15, this is a very short narrative, as you can see, just two verses. And if ever you, in, in future life, think, I've forgotten what a plot is, if you can remember this story, then you've uh, resurrected the plot, okay? So, remember, five steps in the structure of a narrative, five steps to the plot. And the first step, normally called initial situation. This is where we start. So, the initial situation gives us information concerning characters in the story, uh, their situation, and it's the initial situation requires development or destabilization, something to move it on so that the plot will progress. So here in Matthew 8, 14 to 15, the initial situation is that Jesus entered Peter's house. That's the initial situation. But of course, if that's all there is, it's not really a riveting story. We need something to, to move it on, okay? And that brings us to the second step of a plot, which is the complication. And the complication moves the narrative away from that initial situation, moves it on, and it introduces, well, it's done in different ways, but it introduces enough tension to indicate that matters cannot remain at rest. Something has to, something has to happen. So I've called it also the trigger point, okay? So this is what moves the story on. And the complication in this story he saw his mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. So Peter's mother-in-law is in bed with a fever. This is a complication. Initial situation, he just enters the house, but then complication. Peter's mother-in-law has a fever. Something has to respond to that. The third step is given different names depending on where, you, um, where you're reading, but this is a common term, transforming action. And what the transforming action is, it's the means of managing or responding to the complication. So here we have a complication. What are we going to do that responds to that complication and attempts to do something about it? In this story, he touched her hand. So he's making a move towards doing something for Peter's mother-in-law. It's a transforming action. He touched her hand. 
And then the fourth step, the resolution. We had a complication. And here's the resolution of the complication. It, the, the resolution concludes the move started by the transforming action. And it resolves, or at least partially resolves, the issues introduced by the complication. So what's the resolution in this story? The resolution is, and the fever left her, and she got up. What was the complication, remind me? I know after lunch is the, you know, the graveyard shift for speakers, but the, the complication was, she has a fever. The resolution is, the fever left her. You see how the resolution relates directly to the complication. And then we come to the final step, which gives us the final situation. And the final situation brings the narrative to a resting place. It returns to the initial situation or it moves on to a new stage of equilibrium. So the final situation brings the story to a resting place. And how does that work in this short story? And she began to serve him. The story is now over. Now, uh, let's just, yes, let's just look at a summary of that. Okay, so just a quick summary. The, the initial situation, the initial situation is when Jesus entered Peter's house, the complication, uh, he saw her, his mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. The transforming action is that uh, he touched her hand. The resolution and the fever left her and she got up. And the final situation is and began to serve him. This is a very short narrative, right? just two verses, but that's the plot structure going through the five steps, and that is common to most narratives. Now, what I would point out here in this analysis is the critical function of the complication and the resolution. The complication and the resolution form the heart of the narrative. The complication is what is it that makes this narrative move? And the resolution is, what is it that brings this complication to a resting place? There's a complication that needs to be resolved. That's true of all narratives. So, when we come to a biblical narrative, if we want to get to the heart of the matter, first identify the complication, then identify the resolution and the resolution will take us to the heart of the matter. Now, since I've discovered this, I've had to revisit some old sermons you know, that I've preached and realized that I was expanding on matters of secondary importance. So complication, resolution of primary importance, this is where you'll find the heart of the matter. Um, so the resolution in particular is usually the climax of the whole affair, usually the case, because as we'll see a little bit later, this is a, a basic grid and biblical narratives will play with certain variations on this theme. And there are a few stories, as we'll see, which have no resolution. We'll see how to deal with those later on, but generally speaking, it's the resolution that's important. Now, although the resolution is important, you find important elements elsewhere in the story as well. In this particular story, obviously the resolution is important, isn't it? Because that's what got the story going, the fever left her. But the final situation is also very important. It's very simple, it's very profound actually, that Peter's mother-in-law began to serve him. Serve whom? Serve Jesus. That's a profound thought. It might not appear so, but in the time of Jesus, women were not allowed to serve rabbis. But this rabbi relates to women. So the final situation, yes, that also has a profound statement to make. So it's not that everything, I just want to get, make sure I don't give the impression that the only thing you need to take account of is the resolution, no. That's the heart of the matter, but other important elements will, um, will reveal uh, the, the intention of the narrative. Um, now, what I'm going to do next 
That's a very short story. I'm going to do next a longer story. And the story we're going to look at now is actually the story I'm going to give a message on in just a few minutes. And it's the story we find in 2 Samuel chapter 11. This is a longer story. And we'll do the, uh, the same kind of analysis, but this time on a narrative which takes up an entire chapter. Okay, the best part of 30 verses, just under 30 verses. Condensed somewhat so that uh, uh, we do it in, a, in time. So, we already know what the initial situation means, okay? Information concerning a character, and that has to be developed. Well, the initial situation in 2 Samuel 11 is this. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. That's the initial situation. Army's out, David is home. But something needs to happen, right? We need a complication, a trigger point to move that story on. The complication comes in verses 2 to 5. I've condensed it a little bit. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. The woman, uh, you notice I've missed something out here. Uh, the woman conceived. <laughs> And she sent and told David, I'm pregnant. Now, is that a complication? Is that a, compl that's a complication and a half, this one? So there's our complication. Transforming action. Okay. The means of managing or responding to the complication. So how is David going to deal with that complication? What's he going to do? Well, in condensed format, this is what he does. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite, Bathsheba's husband. And David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. <clears throat> but Uriah did not go down to his house. And in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting so that he may be struck down and die. That'll take care of the complication. The resolution. Notice how much space the resolution takes up, verses 16 to 25. We're almost at the end of the story. As Joab was besieging the city, some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite was killed as well. The messenger who comes to David, the messenger said to David, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. David said to the messenger, Do not let this matter trouble you, for the sword devours now one, now another. There's a resolution. And the final situation, when the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him and when the morning was over David sent and brought her to his house she became his wife and bore him a son but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord there's our final situation but you sense with that final sentence it's a rather uneasy final situation. So that's the plot of 2 Samuel 11. We'll be looking at that in more detail later on. And so uh, just to remind you, those the, the, the five steps of a five-fold plot structure. Now, um, we've got to remember that narratives are dynamic, you know, we're relating to them. And so sometimes the transition from one point to the next point. That can be rather than abrupt, it can be gradual, and so, you know, you don't get into theological controversies with people by saying, no, I think it stops halfway through verse two, and somebody says, no, I think it begins at the beginning of verse three. 
They're not abrupt changes usually, but one flows into the other. So where we draw the line can sometimes differ slightly, but those are, in essence, the five main steps. However, not all plots have all five steps. But it's normally seen that almost every narrative needs at least three of them in order to be a, a proper plot. And the three steps that we almost always must have are, first of all, an initial situation. Because if you don't have an initial situation, nothing's going to happen, right? Then complication, resolution. Initial situation, complication, resolution. Those are really more or less, with one or two exceptions, essential. And the others might be there, they might not be there, but those are the general steps that we move through. What I'd like to do now is to ask you to, to do something, which is essentially to look at a short narrative, and I'd like you to work out the plot structure. Okay, so you can discuss this with the person sitting next to you. I think uh, Pastor Jaffert and uh, we've got um, it's a sheet of paper of a short narrative um, from uh, Mark chapter 12, verses 13 to 17. I think maybe we have it there as well. Mark 12, verses 13 to 17. And um, those are the five steps, okay, that you see on the screen. And I'd like you to discuss this if you want to, you know, if you wish to do it in private, silent meditation, that's all right. But if you maybe discuss it with the person next to you and try to work out if you can find these five steps in the narrative that uh, you have. And uh, we'll just take, um, give you just, you know, two, three, four minutes to try and work through that, okay? Okay, let's... Uh Let's try to work our way through this. Um, how many of you, how many think that you've identified the plot structure? Pretty much, good, okay, quite a few of you. Um, others of you don't wish to be dogmatic, that's fine. Um, so, um, with, the, with the number, let, let, me, uh, let me go through this. I think it would be the easiest way, given the number of people here. I'll go through it as the the kind of analysis that I've given, you can tell me whether you agree or not. Okay, is that fair enough? Um, so there's the text that I asked you to have a look at. Uh, and so the initial situation, information concerning characters that need some development. Well, it would seem to me that, um, this is where it begins, verse 13. The initial situation is, they sent to him some Pharisees and some Herodians to trap him in what he said. Okay. Now, I suspect that most of you have the first verse within your initial situation. <laughs> now, it might be that some of you have taken it on a little bit further. Did some of you take it on a little bit further beyond that verse, or did you remain in this verse? I, I wouldn't think any less of you if you if you had, you've gone a little bit. But the, the, the complication then, what is the complication? What's the trigger, you know, which really gets this narrative developed? Well, I'd say it's uh, from verses 14 to the first part of verse 15. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you're sincere and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. When people start talking like that to you, you know, like at the end of the semester, a student comes to me and says, I'd just like to let you know how, how much I've appreciated everything you've done for us this semester you know the student is desperate. <laughs> you know they need a certain mark and nothing is going to prevent them from getting it. All right? So, anyway, you do not regard people with partiality but teach the way of God in accordance with truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why are you putting me to the test? So I think that's the heart of the complication. Now, some of you may have put the first part of verse 15 
as part of the next stage, which is transforming action, okay? Remember I said that you can draw the lines in slightly different ways, but more or less, more or less, that's the complication. The transforming action, bring me a denarius and let me see it. And they brought one. And then he said to them, whose head is this? And whose title? They answered the emperor's. There's a transforming action. It's a means of addressing the complication which should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? It's not a direct answer, it's not a resolution, but it's a step on the way to achieving that. And then the resolution. Jesus said to them, give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. That's the resolution. That's the heart of the matter and the uh, final situation of course is and they were utterly amazed at him that's the final situation did you did you get something like that good okay now that exercise shows that you got this story which has a plot structure and if we're saying well you know you can make a story mean anything you want it to mean no you can't really you can't uh, because the resolution, the heart of the matter is give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. And if, you're, if, if you say that the meaning of the story, the intention of the story is something other than that, you're likely to be wrong because the heart of the story is going to be found usually usually in the resolution. Now, there are some variations on this. I just want to go through these uh, just to show you that uh, you can have variations on, on a theme. And um, uh, here's uh, a variation on the theme from Genesis chapter 18. It's where God, speaking with Abraham about Sodom and Gomorrah. So the initial situation is then the men set out from there and they looked towards Sodom and Abram went with them to set them on their way. There's the situation. The complication. Well, briefly, the Lord said, shall I hide from Abram what I'm about to do? And he's on his way to go down to Sodom and Gomorrah to see what their sin is. Their sin is as bad as he has heard. All right? That's the complication. That's the trigger point which sets the whole thing going. There's the transforming action. <clears throat> so... The men turned from there and went towards Sodom while Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham came near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not forgive it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? resolution and the Lord said if I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city I will forgive the whole place for their sake so there's a resolution right well actually no because there's a second transforming action Abram answered let me take it upon myself to speak to the Lord I am who I am I who am but dust and ashes, suppose five of the righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? And the second resolution, and he said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. So there we have it. No, no, because there's a third transforming action. And he spoke to him, suppose 40 are found there. And he answered, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Uh -huh. For the fourth transforming action. And then he said, oh, do not let the Lord be angry if I speak. Suppose 30 are found here. Kind of a Dutch auction, you know, he's bringing him down. Um, the fourth resolution, he answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. The fifth transforming action, he said, let me take it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. And he answered, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Well, surely we're there now. No, because there's a sixth transforming action. He said, oh, do not let the Lord be angry if I speak just once more. Suppose ten are found there. 
and he answered, for the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. And then the Lord went his way. He wasn't hanging around any longer. <laughs> the Lord went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Now, you see what effect that has? You see, uh, you know, 50, 50, Lord, 50, 45, 45, 30, 30, 30, 30, 20, 20, 20. We say, well, where is it going to end? It draws us into the story. What is going to be the resolution? Ten righteous will save the whole city. Um, now, there's another way in which, uh, this has just occurred to me, uh, actually, a little while back. Um, so I'll throw this in at no extra charge, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, there, are, there are other typical ways in which biblical narratives will delay getting us to the resolution. You know, because we're looking for the resolution. Say, no, no, not yet. No, 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 not yet. You, you just wait. And when you get there, you'll appreciate it a lot more. And this is that in Hebrew narratives, often we have what is called a three and four, three and four uh, structure in the plot. We had one this morning with Samson and Delilah, where she says, Samson, tell me the secret of your strength. Tell me the secret of your strength, number one. And he gives, gives, fobs her off. You don't truly love me. Second time, tell me the secret of your strength and he spins another yarn. Third one, how can you say you love me when your heart is not with me? And he gives her another excuse. And then she says, these three times you've told me lies. And then he told her everything. One, two, three, four. We finally get there. You remember Elijah on Mount Horeb? The Lord was not in the wind, the Lord was not in the fire, the Lord was not in the earthquake. One, two, three, where is he? Still, small voice. So if you're used to that convention, the tension is building up as you, one, two, three, and then we get, and you know that's significant. You can't say, you know, with my knowledge of narrative, is actually the second point which is most important. No, it isn't. <laughs> it is the fault. You cannot make it mean what you, you know. You've got to pay respect to the conventions being used in the story. And then finally, final example of this is what sometimes are called uh, an interrupted story. And this is an intriguing kind of narrative in which the Bible doesn't give us the resolution. Now, the classic example of this is the story of Jonah. And if you remember how the book of Jonah concludes, you know that uh, the Lord has not destroyed Nineveh as Jonah has been, what well, he's been lusting after, the destruction of Nineveh. And the story ends by God asking, and should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? Now, what do you see after the word animals? <clears throat> what do you see after the word animals? A question mark, a question is being asked. And what answer does the book of Jonah give? It doesn't. Because the answer would be the resolution to the story. The book of Jonah is not going to give us the easy way out by telling us what Jonah said. This is a question addressed to you, dear reader. What is your personal resolution? to the question of whether God should love your enemies. How are you going to answer that? And so the, the book leaves that as an open question. Of course, most sermons on Jonah don't trust the congregation, so the, the pastor gives the answer. No, no, if we're going to do justice to this story, 
It's an open-ended story, and people say, oh, there you are again, you see, it can mean anything you like. No, come on, if you've read this story, you know the answer you're supposed to give. If you're not able to give it and mean it, then you haven't learned the lesson of the book of Jonah. Can you say, yes? That's the challenge, but the narrative doesn't give it. It's up to us to provide it. So, knowing what a plot is, the shape of a plot, helps us to see what's of primary importance and what is of secondary importance in a story. Where does it come to a climax? And it nudges us in the direction then of knowing what the story is about. We're going to transition now into uh, a message on 2 Samuel 11. Um, if you just uh, give me a little while just to lubricate my throat, I will return in due season. <laughs> <laughs> 